When I drew nigh the nameless city, I knew it was accursed. I was traveling in a parched and terrible valley under the moon, and afar I saw it protruding uncannily above the sands, as parts of a corpse may protrude from an ill-made grave. Fear spoke from the age-worn stones of this hoary survivor of the deluge, this great-grandmother of the eldest pyramid, and a viewless aura repelled me and bade me retreat from antique and sinister secrets that no man should see, and no man else had ever dared to see. Remote in the desert of Araby lies the nameless city, crumbling and inarticulate, its low walls nearly hidden by the sands of uncounted ages. It must have been thus before the first stones of Memphis were laid, and while the bricks of Babylon were yet unbaked. There is no legend so old as to give it a name, or to recall that it was ever alive, but it is told of in whispers around campfires and muttered about by grandmas in the tents of sheiks, so that all the tribes shun it without wholly knowing why. It was of this place that Abdul al-Hazred, the mad poet, dreamed on the night before he sang his unexplainable couplet, That is not dead, which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. I should have known that the Arabs had good reason for shunning the nameless city, the city told of in strange tales but seen by no living man, yet I defied them and went into the untrodden waste with my camel. I alone have seen it, and that is why no other face bears such hideous lines of fear as mine, why no other man shivers so horribly when the night wind rattles the windows. When I came upon it in the ghastly stillness of unending sleep, it looked at me, chilly from the rays of a cold moon amidst the desert's heat. And as I returned its look, I forgot my triumph at finding it, and stopped still with my camel to wait for the dawn. For hours I waited, till the east grew gray and the stars faded, and the gray turned to roseal light edged with gold. I heard a moaning and saw a storm of sand stirring among the antique stones, though the sky was clear and the vast reaches of the desert still. Then suddenly above the desert's far rim came the blazing edge of the sun, seen through the tiny sandstorm which was passing away. And in my fevered state I fancied that from some remote depth there came a crash of musical metal to hail the fiery disk as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile. My ears rang and my imagination seethed as I led my camel slowly across the sand to that unvocal stone place, that place too old for Egypt or Meroe to remember that place which I alone of living men had seen. In and out amongst the shapeless foundations of houses and palaces I wandered, finding never a carving or inscription to tell of those men, if men they were, who built the city and dwelt therein so long ago. The antiquity of the spot was unwholesome, and I longed to encounter some sign or device to prove that the city was indeed fashioned by mankind. There were certain proportions and dimensions in the ruins which I did not like. I had with me many tools and dug much within the walls of the obliterated edifices, but progress was slow and nothing significant was revealed. When night and the moon returned, I felt a chill wind which brought new fear, so that I did not dare to remain in the city, and as I went outside the antique walls to sleep, a small sighing sandstorm gathered behind me blowing over the gray stones, though the moon was bright and most of the desert still. I awaked just at dawn from a pageant of horrible dreams, my ears ringing as from some metallic peal. I saw the sun peering redly through the last gusts of a little sandstorm that hovered over the nameless city and marked the quietness of the rest of the landscape. Once more I ventured within those brooding ruins that swelled beneath the sand like an ogre under a coverlet and again dug vainly for relics of the forgotten race. At noon I rested, and in the afternoon I spent much time tracing the walls and the bygone streets and the outlines of the nearly vanished buildings. I saw that the city had been mighty indeed, and wondered at the sources of its greatness. To myself I pictured all the splendors of an age so distant that Chaldea could not recall it, and thought of Sarnath the Doomed, that stood in the land of Menar when mankind was young and of Ib that was carven of gray stone before mankind existed. All at once I came upon a place where the bedrock rose stark through the sand and formed a low cliff, 
and here I saw with joy what seemed to promise further traces of the antediluvian people. Hewn rudely on the face of the cliff were the unmistakable facades of several small, squat rock houses or temples, whose interiors might preserve many secrets of ages too remote for calculation, though sandstorms had long since effaced any carvings which may have been outside. Very low and sand-choked were all of the dark apertures near me, but I cleared one with my spade and crawled through it, carrying a torch to reveal whatever mysteries it might hold. When I was inside, I saw that the cavern was indeed a temple, and beheld plain signs of the race that had lived and worshipped before the desert was a desert. Primitive altars, pillars, and niches, all curiously low, were not absent, and though I saw no sculptures nor frescoes, there were many singular stones clearly shaped into symbols by artificial means. The lowness of the chiseled chamber was very strange, for I could hardly more than kneel upright, but the area was so great that my torch showed only part at a time. I shuddered oddly in some of the far corners, for certain altars and stones suggested forgotten rites of terrible, revolting, and inexplicable nature, and made me wonder what manner of men could have made and frequented such a temple. When I had seen all that the place contained, I crawled out again, avid to find what the other temples might yield. Night had now approached, yet the tangible things I had seen made curiosity stronger than fear, so that I did not flee from the long, moon-cast shadows that had daunted me when first I saw the nameless city. In the twilight I cleared another aperture, and with a new torch crawled into it, finding more vague stones and symbols, though nothing more definite than the other temple had contained. The room was just as low, but much less broad, ending in a very narrow passage, crowded with obscure and cryptical shrines. About these shrines I was prying, when the noise of a wind and of my camel outside broke through the stillness and drew me forth to see what could have frightened the beast. The moon was gleaming vividly over the primeval ruins, lighting a dense cloud of sand that seemed blown by a strong but decreasing wind from some point along the cliff ahead of me. I knew it was this chilly, sandy wind which had disturbed the camel, and was about to lead him to a place of better shelter when I chanced to glance up and saw that there was no wind atop the cliff. This astonished me and made me fearful again, but I immediately recalled the sudden local winds I had seen and heard before at sunrise and sunset and judged it was a normal thing. I decided that it came from some rock fissure leading to a cave and watched the troubled sand to trace it to its source, soon perceiving that it came from a black orifice of a temple a long distance south of me, almost out of sight. Against the choking sand cloud I plodded towards this temple, which as I neared it loomed larger than the rest, and showed a doorway far less clogged with caked sand. I would have entered had not the terrific force of the icy wind almost quenched my torch. It poured madly out of the dark door, sighing uncannily as it ruffled the sand and spread about the weird ruins. Soon it grew fainter, and the sand grew more and more still, till finally all was at rest again. But a presence seemed stalking among the spectral stones of the city. But a presence seemed stalking among the spectral stones of the city, and when I glanced at the moon it seemed to quiver as though mirrored in unquiet waters. I was more afraid than I could explain, but not enough to dull my thirst for wonder. So as soon as the wind was quite gone, I crossed into the dark chamber from which it had come. This temple, as I had fancied from the outside, was larger than either of those I had visited before, and was presumably a natural cavern, since it bore winds from some region beyond. Here I could stand quite upright, but saw that the stones and altars were as low as those in the other temples. On the walls and roof I beheld for the first time some traces of the pictorial art of the ancient race, curious curling streaks of paint that had almost faded or crumbled away, and on two of the altars I saw with rising excitement a maze of well-fashioned curvilinear carvings. As I held my torch aloft it seemed to me that the shape of the roof was too regular to be natural, and I wondered what the prehistoric cutters of stone had first worked upon. Their engineering skill must have been vast. Then a brighter flare of the fantastic flame showed me that for which I had been seeking, the opening to those remoter abysses whence the sudden wind had blown, 
and I grew faint when I saw that it was a small and plainly artificial door chiseled in the solid rock. I thrust my torch within, beholding a black tunnel with the roof arching low over a rough flight of very small, numerous, and steeply descending steps. I shall always see those steps in my dreams, for I came to learn what they meant. At the time, I hardly knew whether to call them steps or mere footholds in a precipitous descent. My mind was whirling with mad thoughts, and the words and warnings of Arab prophets seemed to float across the desert from the lands that men know to the nameless city that men dare not know. Yet I hesitated only a moment before advancing through the portal and commencing to climb cautiously down the steep passage, feet first, as though on a ladder. It is only in the terrible phantasms of drugs or delirium that any other man can have had such a descent as mine. The narrow passage led infinitely down, like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths towards which I was crawling. I lost track of the hours, and forgot to consult my watch, though I was frightened when I thought of the distance I must be traversing. There were changes of direction and of steepness, and once I came to a long, low, level passage, where I had to wriggle feet first along the rocky floor, holding my torch at arm's length beyond my head. The place was not high enough for kneeling. After that were more of the steep steps, and I was still scrambling down interminably when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice it, I was still holding it high above me, as if it were a blaze. I was quite unbalanced with that instinct for the strange and the unknown which has made me a wanderer upon earth and a haunter of far ancient and forbidden places. In the darkness there flashed before my mind fragments of my cherished treasury of demonic lore, sentences from al Hazred the Mad Arab, paragraphs from the apocryphal nightmares of Damascus, and infamous lines from the delirious Image du Monde of Gautier de Metz. I repeated queer extracts and muttered of Afrasiab and the demons that floated with him down the Oxus, later chanting over and over again a phrase from one of Lord Dunsany's tales, the unreverberate blackness of the abyss. Once, when the descent grew amazingly steep, I recited something in sing-song from Thomas More until I feared to recite more. A reservoir of darkness black, as witches' cauldrons are when filled, with moon drugs in the eclipse distilled, leaning to look if foot might pass. Down through that chasm I saw beneath, as far as vision could explore, the jetty sides as smooth as glass, looking as if just varnished ore. With that dark pitch the sea of death throws out upon its slimy shore. Time had quite ceased to exist when my feet again felt a level floor, and I found myself in a place slightly higher than the rooms in the two smaller temples, now so incalculably far above my head. I could not quite stand, but could kneel upright, and in the dark I shuffled and crept hither and thither at random. I soon knew that I was in a narrow passage whose walls were lined with cases of wood having glass fronts. As in that Paleozoic and abysmal place I felt of such things as polished wood and glass I shuddered at the possible implications. The cases were apparently arranged along each side of the passage at regular intervals, and were oblong and horizontal, hideously like coffins in shape and size. When I tried to move two or three for further examination, I found they were firmly fastened. I saw that the passage was a long one, so floundered ahead rapidly in a creeping run that would have seemed horrible had any eye watched me in the blackness. Crossing from side to side occasionally to feel my surroundings and be sure the walls and rows of cases still stretched on. Man is so used to thinking visually that I almost forgot the darkness and pictured the endless corridor of wood and glass in its low studded monotony as though I saw it. And then, in a moment of indescribable emotion, I did see it. Just when my fancy merged into real sight, I cannot tell, but there came a gradual glow ahead and all at once I knew that I saw the dim outlines of the corridor and the cases, revealed by some unknown subterranean phosphorescence. For a little while all was exactly as I had imagined it, since the glow was very faint. But as I mechanically kept on stumbling ahead into the stronger light, I realized that my fancy had been but feeble. 
This hall was no relic of crudity like the temples in the city above, but a monument of the most magnificent and exotic art. Rich, vivid, and daringly fantastic designs and pictures formed a continuous scheme of mural painting whose lines and colors were beyond description. The cases were of a strange golden wood with fronts of exquisite glass and contained the mummified forms of creatures outreaching in grotesqueness the most chaotic dreams of man. To convey any idea of these monstrosities is impossible. They were of the reptile kind, with body lines suggesting sometimes the crocodile, sometimes the seal, but more often nothing of which either the naturalist or the paleontologist ever heard. In size they approximated a small man, but their forelegs bore delicate and evidently flexible feet, curiously like human hands and fingers. But strangest of all were their heads, which presented a contour violating all known biological principles. To nothing can such things be well compared. In one flash I thought of comparisons as varied as the cat, the bulldog, the mythic satyr, and the human being. Not Jove himself had so colossal and protuberant a forehead, yet the horns and the noselessness and the alligator-like jaw placed the thing outside all established categories. I debated for a time on the reality of the mummies, half suspecting they were artificial idols, but soon decided they were indeed some paleogen species which had lived when the nameless city was alive. To crown their grotesqueness, most of them were gorgeously enrobed in the costliest of fabrics, and lavishly laden with ornaments of gold, jewels, and unknown shining metals. The importance of these crawling creatures must have been vast, for they held first place among the wild designs of the frescoed walls and ceilings. With matchless skill had the artists drawn them in a world of their own, wherein they had cities and gardens fashioned to suit their dimensions, and I could not but think that their pictured history was allegorical, perhaps showing the progress of the race that worshipped them. These creatures, I said to myself, were to the men of the nameless city what the she-wolf was to Rome or some totem beast is to a tribe of Indians. Holding this view, I thought I could trace roughly a wonderful epic of the nameless city, the tale of a mighty seacoast metropolis that ruled the world before Africa rose out of the waves, and of its struggles as the sea shrank away and the desert crept into the fertile valley that held it. I saw its wars and triumphs, its troubles and defeats, and afterward its terrible fight against the desert when thousands of its people here represented in allegory by the grotesque reptiles, were driven to chisel their way down through the rocks in some marvelous manner to another world whereof their prophets had told them. It was all vividly weird and realistic, and its connection with the awesome descent I had made was unmistakable. I even recognized the passages. As I crept along the corridor toward the brighter light, I saw the later stages of the painted epic the leave-taking of the race that had dwelt in the nameless city and the valley around for ten million years, the race whose souls shrank from quitting scenes their bodies had known so long, where they had settled as nomads in the earth's youth, hewing in the virgin rock those primal shrines at which they never ceased to worship. Now that the light was better, I studied the pictures more closely, and remembering that the strange reptiles must represent the unknown men, pondered upon the customs of the nameless city. Many things were peculiar and inexplicable. The civilization, which included a written alphabet, had seemingly risen to a higher order than those immeasurably later civilizations of Egypt and Chaldea, yet there were curious omissions. I could, for example, find no pictures to represent deaths or funeral customs, save such as were related to wars, violence, and plagues and I wondered at the reticence shown concerning natural death. It was as though the ideal of earthly immortality had been fostered as a cheering illusion. Still nearer the end of the passage were painted scenes of the utmost picturesqueness and extravagance, contrasted views of the nameless city in its desertion and growing ruin, and of the strange new realm or paradise to which the race had hewed its way through the stone. In these views, the city and the desert valley were shown always by moonlight, a golden nimbus hovering over the fallen walls and half revealing the splendid perfection of former times, shown spectrally and elusively by the artist. The paradisal scenes were almost too extravagant to be believed, 
portraying a hidden world of eternal day filled with glorious cities and ethereal hills and valleys. At the very last, I thought I saw signs of an artistic anticlimax. The paintings were less skillful and much more bizarre than even the wildest of the earlier scenes. They seemed to record a slow decadence of the ancient stock, coupled with a growing ferocity toward the outside world from which it was driven by the desert. The forms of the people, always represented by the sacred reptiles, appeared to be gradually wasting away, though their spirit, as shown hovering about the ruins by moonlight, gained in proportion. Emaciated priests, displayed as reptiles in ornate robes, cursed the upper air and all who breathed it. And one terrible final scene showed a primitive-looking man, perhaps a pioneer of ancient Irem, the city of pillars, torn to pieces by members of the elder race. I remembered how the Arabs fear the nameless city, and was glad that beyond this place the gray walls and ceiling were bare. As I viewed the pageant of mural history, I had approached very closely the end of the low-sealed hall, and was aware of a great gate through which came all the illuminating phosphorescence. Creeping up to it, I cried aloud in transcendent amazement at what lay beyond, for instead of other and brighter chambers there was only an illimitable void of uniform radiance such as one might fancy when gazing down from the peak of Mount Everest upon a sea of sunlit mist. Behind me was a passage so cramped that I could not stand upright in it. Before me was an infinity of subterranean effulgence. Reaching down from the passage into the abyss was the head of a steep flight of steps, small numerous steps like those of the black passages I had traversed, but after a few feet the glowing vapors concealed everything, Swung back open against the left-hand wall of the passage was a massive door of brass, incredibly thick and decorated with fantastic bas-reliefs, which could, if closed, shut the whole inner world of light away from the vaults and the passages of rock. I looked at the steps, and for the nuns dared not try them. I touched the open brass door and could not move it. Then I sank prone to the stone floor, my mind aflame with prodigious reflections which not even a death-like exhaustion could banish. As I lay still with closed eyes, free to ponder, many things I had lightly noted in the frescoes came back to me with new and terrible significance. Scenes representing the nameless city in its heyday, the vegetation of the valley around it, and the distant lands with which its merchants traded. The allegory of the crawling creatures puzzled me by its universal prominence and I wondered that it should be so closely followed in a pictured history of such importance. In the frescoes, the nameless city had been shown in proportions fitted to the reptiles. I wondered what its real proportions and magnificence had been, and reflected a moment on certain oddities I had noticed in the ruins. I thought curiously of the lowness of the primal temples and of the underground corridor, which were doubtless hewn thus out of deference to the reptile deities there honored though it perforce reduced the worshippers to crawling. Perhaps the very rites had involved a crawling in imitation of the creatures. No religious theory, however, could easily explain why the level passage in that awesome descent should be as low as the temples, or lower, since one could not even kneel in it. As I thought of the crawling creatures, whose hideous mummified forms were so close to me, I felt a new throb of fear. Mental associations are curious, and I shrank from the idea that, except for the poor primitive man torn to pieces in the last painting, mine was the only human form amidst the many relics and symbols of primordial life. But as always in my strange and roving existence, wonder soon drove out fear, for the luminous abyss and what it might contain presented a problem worthy of the greatest explorer. That a weird world of mystery lay far down that flight of peculiarly small steps I could not doubt, and I hoped to find there those human memorials which the painted corridor had failed to give. The frescoes had pictured unbelievable cities, hills, and valleys in this lower realm, and my fancy dwelt on the rich and colossal ruins that awaited me. My fears, indeed, concerned the past rather than the future. Not even the physical horror of my position in that cramped corridor of dead reptiles and antediluvian frescoes, miles below the world I knew, and faced by another world of eerie light and mist, could match the lethal dread I felt at the abysmal antiquity of the scene and its soul. An ancientness so vast that measurement is feeble seemed to leer down from the primal stones and rock-hewn temples in the nameless city, 
while the very latest of the astounding maps in the frescoes showed oceans and continents that man has forgotten, with only here and there some vaguely familiar outline. Of what could have happened in the geological aeons since the painting ceased and the death-hating race resentfully succumbed to decay, no man might say. Life had once teemed in these caverns and in the luminous realm beyond. Now I was alone with vivid relics, and I trembled to think of the countless ages through which these relics had kept a silent and deserted vigil. Suddenly there came another burst of that acute fear which had intermittently seized me ever since I first saw the terrible valley and the nameless city under a cold moon, and despite my exhaustion I found myself starting frantically to a sitting posture and gazing back along the black corridor toward the tunnels that rose to the outer world. My sensations were much like those which had made me shun the nameless city at night, and were as inexplicable as they were poignant. In another moment, however, I received a still greater shock in the form of a definite sound, the first which had broken the utter silence of these tomb-like depths. It was a deep, low moaning, as of a distant throng of condemned spirits and came from the direction in which I was staring. Its volume rapidly grew, till soon it reverberated frightfully through the low passage, and at the same time I became conscious of an increasing draft of cold air, likewise flowing from the tunnels and the city above. The touch of this air seemed to restore my balance, for I instantly recalled the sudden gust which had risen around the mouth of the abyss each sunset and sunrise, one of which had indeed served to reveal the hidden tunnels to me. I looked at my watch and saw that sunrise was near, so braced myself to resist the gale which was sweeping down to its cavern home as it had swept forth at evening. My fear again waned low, since a natural phenomenon tends to dispel broodings over the unknown. More and more madly poured the shrieking, moaning night wind into that gulf of the inner earth. I dropped prone again and clutched vainly at the floor for fear of being swept bodily through the open gate into the phosphorescent abyss. Such fury I had not expected, and as I grew aware of an actual slipping of my form toward the abyss, I was beset by a thousand new terrors of apprehension and imagination. The malignancy of the blast awakened incredible fancies. Once more I compared myself shudderingly to the only other human image in that frightful corridor, the man who was torn to pieces by the nameless race for in the fiendish clawing of the swirling currents there seemed to abide a vindictive rage all the stronger because it was largely impotent. I think I screamed frantically near the last, I was almost mad, but if I did so, my cries were lost in the hell-born babble of the howling wind-wraiths. I tried to crawl against the murderous invisible torrent, but I could not even hold my own as I was pushed slowly and inexorably toward the unknown world. Finally reason must have wholly snapped, for I fell to babbling over and over that unexplainable couplet of the mad Arab al Hazret, who dreamed of the nameless city, that is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange aeons even death may die. Only the grim, brooding desert gods know what really took place, what indescribable struggles and scrambles in the dark I endured, or what Abaddon guided me back to life where I must always remember and shiver in the night wind till oblivion, or worse, claims me. Monstrous, unnatural, colossal was the thing, too far beyond all the ideas of man to be believed, except in the silent, damnable small hours when one cannot sleep. I have said that the fury of the rushing blast was infernal, cacodemoniacal, and that its voices were hideous with the pent-up viciousness of desolate eternities. Presently those voices, while still chaotic before me, seemed to my beating brain to take articulate form behind me, and down there in the grave of unnumbered aeon-dead antiquities, leagues below the dawnlit world of men, I heard the ghastly cursing and snarling of strange-tongued fiends. Turning, I saw outlined against the luminous ether of the abyss what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor, a nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate-distorted, grotesquely penelopied, half-transparent. Devils of a race no man might mistake, the crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And as the wind died away, I was plunged into the ghoul-peopled blackness of Earth's bowels, for behind the last of the creatures the great brazen door clanged shut with a deafening peal of metallic music, whose reverberations swelled out to the distant world to hail the rising sun 
as Memnon hails it from the banks of the Nile.